thank you very much for coming to my session. Swearing, nudity, and other vulnerable positions. Now, before we begin, I just need to apologize. So, there's very, very unlikely, I won't rule it out completely, but there's very unlikely to be any nudity in this session. So, now, we will be doing some improvisation later. Now, if you do decide to kind of really let yourselves go in that exercise, just keep in mind the people in your direct vicinity while, uh, while doing that. So, my name is John LeDru. I've spent the last two decades or so in software engineering, and I've done many different things in that time. Um, about well, 2016, I decided to start this podcast called The Agile Path. And while I knew I wanted to do something that was creatively different from the other kind of podcasts in the Agile space, I really had no idea what I wanted to talk about. So, uh, with my microphone in hand, I went off to Lean Agile Scotland that year, um, jumped on a really early morning train from my home in Manchester up to Edinburgh, um, and arrived, amazingly, just in time for the opening keynote. And I just spent the day talking to people. I'd say, hey, you know, what really matters to you about teams, about people, about collaboration, about organizational effectiveness, about etc.? What is the thing that, that you really care about? Um, and they kept saying things like, like, well, safety. And I was like, well, what do you mean by this word, safety? They'd say, oh, you know, the team just wasn't safe. You could see this team wasn't safe. And I was someone that worked with teams and worked in organizations. I kind of knew instinctively what they meant by that, but I wanted to dig deeper. I didn't really know what they meant by that. And You'd, you'd ask people, and they'd say things like, well, you know, what, what does, really, what does that mean? So, you know, you can see by the way they walk into the room, by the way they talk to each other, by the way they make eye contact with each other, etc. all of these things. You know, you can see it. But it felt like safety was essential, but enigmatic, like dark matter or dark energy, it seems to be holding the entire universe together, but nobody knows what the hell it is. So, I left Lean Agile Scotland with 99 problems, uh, but what to speak about on my podcast wasn't one of them. I knew that safety was the thing. I left with safety, kind of. But what I didn't know that day was that I'd left uh, that morning with undiagnosed gout in my wrist. Now, for anyone that has ever had gout, uh, which I'm looking at the audience, it's quite a useful lot, uh, that, that possibly not, uh, but it's an excruciatingly painful thing that's commonly associated with middle-aged alcoholics from the 17th century, um, which I, hopefully you can tell, don't, don't fit that profile. So it was rather surprising <laughs> to me to discover that's what I had. Now, at the beginning of the day, this was just an achy wrist. By the end of the day, my wrist was about so big, and, and, it, and it felt like anything that touched it felt like my arm was being ripped off at the shoulder. Um, and I find myself at the, the station barrier on my way back to Manchester, and my ticket is here. This is the wrist that's swollen up, and I can't get that ticket. And I can't reach it with this hand, however much I tried, I just couldn't quite get it. And there's an increasingly irate Scotsman stood behind me, wanting to get through the barrier. Um, and my only option at that point was to turn to him <laughs> and ask for some assistance. Now, needless to say, neither of us felt particularly safe at that moment. <laughs> so, so, thankfully, I made it home. <laughs> and I reached out to a whole load of different people in the Agile community. And um, and I was asking them the same questions, what matters to you? And then, and then they say, oh, well, it's all about this safety thing, and I'd discuss it, and we'd go into a lot of depth, hours and hours of interviews. So I also started my own research. Now, that took me to this project, Google's Project Aristotle. So uh, Google, pretty big company, you might have heard of it. Um, they, they wanted to find out with this project, this piece of research, 
why is it that team A is a great team and team B is less of a great team? Why do we have some of teams, you know, some teams that are very effective and some teams that aren't effective? And they wanted to challenge the, the kind of obvious assumption that team A has awesome people and team B not so much. So what did they uh, what they tried to do here was, was this assumption that a team is always the sum of its parts. They wanted to challenge this idea. Um, and what they, what they really came to was that, well, actually, how effective a team is, is way less about who's on the team and far more about how the team members actually work together. So what makes a great team? So what they found was five indicators, and these indicators were what they discovered that team members, when interviewed and, uh, and asked on the highly effective teams at Google, um, these indicators were present. So uh, this is individuals on effective teams. So at number five, we have one they call impact. So team members think that their work matters and actually creates change in the organization. This is them understanding and thinking that the stuff they're working on actually affects something. Amazingly, amazingly, this isn't a very common facet of many organizations. Um, when you work at, if you start working at Facebook, they have a thing they call their boot camp. It's a six-week program where any engineer at Facebook, regardless of whether you join as a junior or a senior experience engineer, will spend six weeks in this boot camp program. And during that time, generally, on the first day, if not the first couple of days, you are going to put code live on Facebook.com. That change is often a small visual change. I, there's a lot of engineers here, so it would be like a CSS change or something similar. And what's interesting is that a CSS change is generally pretty low risk, um, but it's also visual. <laughs> and what's important here is that those people literally see a change that they have made to the pop most popular, one of the most popular websites in the world, on their first day. And that makes them feel like they have impact, you know, ringing your mum and going, hey, mum, look at Facebook.com. See that button? It's a slightly different shade of blue. You know, <laughs> it's a great day for that person. Another thing is that um, it was, there was a, another piece of research done by a lady called Teresa Armablay in a book called The Progress Principle. And what she did was interview thousands of individuals, or rather, they did daily diary entries, thousands of individuals across the US um, and they were in a whole range of different knowledge worker teams. So we're talking about anyone from software engineering teams, but also teams of architects, teams of civil engineers, etc., all across. And they were giving these daily diary entries of, of how their daily work went. They did that for six months. And what she found was that the team members that were the most motivated and engaged made regular progress on meaningful work. So this is the people that were um, far more engaged in this study were people that every day were reporting small wins, that they felt that they had achieved something every single day. There's another part of this, <laughs> um, meaningful work, which takes us to conveniently to number four. Work is personally important to the team members. So, in 1983, Steve Jobs calls John Scully and says, hey, do you want to sell sugared water for the rest of your life, or do you want to come and help me change the world? John Scully at the time was um, working at Pepsi. Um, what he was doing there was tapping into this deep-seated human desire to do something that matters. You know, we want to have meaning in what we do. We want to know what we're doing matters in the world in some way. Um, but immediately I get people going, all right, but that's all very well, except my company, you know, I work in insurance, or my, my company's an estate agency, <laughs> or I don't know, even worse, potentially, I work for the government, you know. Um, I don't have any meaning in my work. You know, I'm not curing cancer or alleviating the world of poverty or putting a desktop computer in every home, as, as was Apple's goal at the time. So how do I find meaning? Well, 
interestingly, meaning is something that doesn't necessarily have to have some kind of big universal context. Clearly, it helps. If your organization is genuinely alleviating the world of poverty, you're probably going to have less of a struggle in finding meaning in your work. Although, granted, having worked with a number of charities that are doing just that, uh, amazingly, they can still struggle with the same things that organizations that don't have. What's important here is that meaning is a personal thing. So what's interesting is that generally what you find is that people find meaning from work just because they feel like they can do the best work they can do, that they're in an environment that actually encourages them to do really good work. They get to the end of the day, they look at what they've done, and they go, that was awesome, that's great, I'm actually feeling some pride in what I delivered today. So another thing that's really critical to, in, to motivation is supporting another person. So that day when you help that other person in your team with a particular problem, that connection that you had, feels great. And um, there was a study in 1999 from Alistair Coburn, pardon me, and Laurie Williams into pair programming. And this is a fairly well-known study. It demonstrated there was uh, you know, a 13% decrease in speed with delivery, uh, but a 25% decrease in the number of defects. So, the, you know, it, it pans out pretty effectively. Now, what another thing that I found really interesting that came out of that study was that 96% of the developers on the study said, we enjoy our work more while pairing than when we weren't pairing. And 95% said they had greater confidence in the solutions that they ended up producing in the code they wrote, which I think is a, is a really fascinating thing. The meaning there came from the satisfaction that they were doing the best they could do as a result of pairing. They had greater confidence in the work they were delivering, but also in the support they were mutually giving to one another in that pairing relationship. So then we come to structuring clarity. Amazingly, teams that know what they're doing do better at what they're doing. It's, it's pretty obvious to some degree, um, but this also has some other areas. This means that there is a synchronization between the organizational goal, the team goal, the department goal, the project goal. That's not that common. So I do an exercise with teams around this where I give each team member a post-it note. And I just say, all right, so what I'd like you to do is write three words um, on this post-it note that identify, let's say, the team goal or the organization goal or the project goal. But go away, do that in secret, OK? They hand me their post-it notes, and I stick them up on the wall. And we look at that level of synchronization, look where they match, where they don't match. Once I've had them all synchronizing, um, I stuck up the, in this case, there was eight post-it notes on the wall. Um, and I was presented with eight question marks. <laughs> so I find that many times teams have far less understanding of what the organizational goals are than you might imagine. And as another point, you can start to see how these things are interrelated as well. If you think about impact being highly important, if you don't know what the goals are, then how the hell do you know if you're moving towards them or not? So. Next, dependability. Another uh, potentially, on one phase, very obvious one. Getting shit done as a team means that you are considered more dependable than the teams that don't. Kind of obvious, pretty obvious. But interesting, dependability breaks down into two facets. You have external dependability, i.e. delivering things. That's great. Other teams, other people from outside the team can depend upon your team to deliver things on top of your onboard your commitments. But then there's also internal interdependability between team members. And that means that as a team member, when I say, I'm going to be working on this today, and I think I'll get it done by the end of the day, that there is confidence that I will get that done. And the other team members kind of have and believe that statement. But what people often say is, they say, OK, all right, so that, but, you know, we're in technology. You know, I might say with all genuine belief that I will get this done by the end of the day, but I just don't because stuff happens because it's more complicated than I thought. This happens all the time. How does this system 
stay, you know, stay, stay up if the moment someone uh, reneges on their commitment because of a genuine problem, the, you know, how does it hold up? Surely we will never have interdependability. And what's important here, and it brings us straight to the, the main topic, is this doesn't only say I will always get my commitments done or the system falls down. This says that I will tell you with the best of my belief that I believe I will get this thing done by the end of the day or by next week or whenever I'm saying it. But if I get stuck and I need help, I'm going to ask for it. And that brings us straight to psychological safety, and we're going to dive into this, obviously, in, in quite a bit more depth. One of the things that's important on this to remember before we go into this in more detail is that psychological safety is number one. <laughs> it's not just number one. It's also underpinning all of the other four attributes, all of the other four indicators. Whereas they certainly found situations where some teams were, would score low on impact, for example, or score low on dependability, but potentially still have higher scores in the other areas. There wasn't one team in Google where they scored low on psychological safety and had any of the other four indicators. So, why does this safety thing matter? What's so important about it? It's because we really care about doing things that might affect negatively how other people perceive us. Um, and that generally breaks down, certainly in a professional context, around these three areas, competence, awareness, and positivity. So competence, do you always feel that you can ask for help without being judged on your competence? Maybe. Do you always feel with awareness that you can ask what the goal is without feeling like you're the only one and out of the loop? And positivity, do you always feel like you can raise the red flag when a project seems to be heading in the wrong direction? without being judged. Positivity is a really interesting one. Um, I'm going to describe a person for you in the organization. So you may well be working with this person right now. Uh, what I'd like you to do is just raise your hand if you can associate with the name Energy Black Hole. Who's worked with an Energy Black Hole before? Yeah, so now leave, leave your hands up for a moment, and I'm going to ask you another way. Leave your hands up if that person has been in the organization, let's just say, longer than other people. One or two. So those that have just put their hands down on that one, I'm just going to say hiring practices are kind of important. <laughs> um, they, they, just, just as a general thing. Um, what's interesting is, is that, you, yeah, you can put your hands down. I tend to not say, because it's quite fun to see how long people leave their hands up for. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, what's interesting with this is that these people is if you imagine their first day in the organization, okay? So this is probably a few thousand years ago, um, and they walk into the meeting room on their first day to meet the team. They sit down, and I'm pretty certain they don't go, oh, shit, another day. Because, again, if that was the case, hiring practices, um, but what's interesting there is, is that they probably didn't bring their air of negativity, cynicism, grumpiness <laughs> to the organization when they started. So if they didn't bring it with them, what did the organization do to them? So let's come back. Psychological safety. In 99, um, Amy Ebenson, uh, published this paper, um, and she was probably the first person, not the first person to look at psychological safety generally, but the first person to look at it within the context of a team as opposed to an individual. And she defines it as this, psychological safety is a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. I really struggled with this definition when I first read it, and I specifically struggled with these words, punished and humiliated. Because it, they just seemed like such strong words. Now, I'm not completely clueless to the fact that there are organizations out there that are genuinely abusive, that are horrible places to be. But 
psychological safety is a thing that affects every organization everywhere. You know, and there are plenty of dysfunctional organizations that are struggling that aren't abusive inherently in their behavior. And when I hear words like punished, I just imagine some poor team having failed their last sprint and the manager saying, go and stand in the store cupboard for 30 minutes and think about what you've done. <laughs> Or some poor engineer who's just admitted to not knowing what NoSQL database came out last minute and, uh, and all of the team standing in a circle laughing at them. And I can't, I couldn't get that. And I suddenly realized that this is not describing an observable thing. This is not describing something that I can be as a fly on the wall, as they say, watching this and going, oh, yeah, that person has been punished or that person has been humiliated. In some cases it is, but it's not normally that blatant because if you were on the team that failed the sprint and your manager decided that it was your fault and that bonus that you expected to receive for Christmas or that pay rise or that promotion kind of just went away, you'd probably feel punished. And if you did put your hand up and say, oh, I've never used, you know, FUBAR Object Data 3.1 before, and the team go, really, it's been out for like 25 seconds, have you not read that <laughs> already? Um, they they, uh, you might feel a little humiliated, especially if that's done in public. This is how it feels, not how it looks. So, to bring us to our little exercise, one of the chaps I interviewed was a guy called Phelan McDermott. He's an Olivier Award-winning theatre director and has used improvisation for some 20 years in his practice. What he told me was this interesting idea called what he described as the yes and muscle. Now, has anyone in this room ever done improvisation before? Has anyone seen like an improv show before? So you sort of know maybe a little bit. So in improv, um, you generally have a group of performers um, and those performers are going to act out a scene um, based purely on some sort of inspiration or context. A lot of the time that's defined as a thing called the platform, and generally that actually comes from the audience in a lot of cases. Not all the time, but many cases. Now, it could happen that you have an actor on a stage and they walk through an imaginary door and say, Honey, I'm home! And there are hopefully, I'm a little low on performers today, but there are hopefully other performers, <laughs> and They're going to follow this process, so this means that the first thing they do, the other performers, is that they hear what's known as an offer. This offer, honey, I'm home. So what's that offer telling me? I'm going to listen to that and think, hmm, okay. Now, point it out, this is hopefully going to happen a little quicker than it will in this explanation. This is going to happen, but what's important is I'm not going to block this idea. I'm just listening to see what this person has given me, what idea has been contributed, what's good about this idea. And I'm going to then take that idea and add to it with my idea, with my contribution, with my way of continuing the story. The goal being, in this case, to tell a story. And what might happen is I think, okay, well, that person could be a husband, it could be my dad, it could be, I don't know, maybe, maybe he's lying, maybe he's actually a murderer and he's just faking it. Oh, I don't know. There's a whole bunch of things. And I might eventually settle on, I'm just in the shower, darling, I'll be down in a minute. And then the story continues. What's important, and we're going to do a couple of exercises here, is you need to pay attention to your fellow performers to make sure that you are actually expanding upon what they have contributed and not creating an environment that stymies creativity. What I'd like you to do as well is, I imagine most of us at some point, maybe next week, will find ourselves in a meeting, sat around a meeting table, trying to solve a problem with a group of people. That's what we tend to do a lot of in our organizations. Think about this idea when you're in that setting, when ideas are put up, when someone says, what about if we... And think about what would happen if you held this idea as opposed to, yes, but. 
So, we're going to do a little exercise. For this, you are going to need to find a partner. So if you can all stand up for me and find someone nearby. If we are short on partners, then someone can come up on stage and help me demonstrate it. Would you like to come up? Would you like to come up here, if that's okay? Would you like to come up here and you can... You, there are stairs there, but you can... Oh, look at that. Beautiful. So, what I'd like you to do, and try and maintain silence, is you will need to stand opposite your partner and hold your hands up, it's like, yeah, and mirror one another, okay? In silence, you are going to start moving. Now, what's important is that you need to maintain eye contact with the person. Now, the aim is to mirror one another, but you will find that you don't really know which one of you is the mirror <laughs> and which one of you is being controlled. <laughs> And I just, I don't, depth is hard. <laughs> and one of the things you will also discover is that you will form deep, long-lasting relationships with these people afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that's a, a brilliantly a brilliant warm-up exercise. I do recommend doing that for two minutes at the start of retrospectives, you'll freak everyone out completely. <laughs> um, so we're going to do another exercise now. Um, this exercise is called String of Pearls. This requires a little more uh, involvement from everyone. So what we're going to do is tell a story. Our story is going to start here. A volunteer is going to come up, that's one of you, uh, is going to come up and start the story with a simple sentence. Once upon a time, it was a dark and stormy night. We were at a weird conference. Someone made us uh, connect psychically with someone I didn't know. Um, and then another volunteer is going to come up and stand here, and they're going to end the story. So at this point, what we all have is a sentence that begins the story and a sentence that ends the story. And then, like any good uh, agile team, we will iterate on that story. So individuals will come up and voluntarily add sentences and bits and pieces, and we keep going until we've connected the two dots, and we have a story that flows all the way, at which point everyone is obligated to leap up in the air and cheer ecstatically and loudly. Uh, and if you've got, like, roses or... No, don't throw anything, actually. That's a good idea. So, if we could begin, so who would like to start our story? Any ideas? If anyone wants to come up, once upon a time, that's always a good, go, go for it. So if you come up, you can either like leap up onto the stage like a talented gymnast, or there is a very narrow set of stairs over there. Um, oh, look at that. <laughs> Superb. Oh, now I need, before you begin, yes, I almost forgot it. Is this on? Is this on? I hope it's on. Who wants to test it? I was cutting it. Oh, it's on. Perfect. There we go. <laughs> so you say your line. I was about to deploy our new service to production. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. And the end of the story. So this is the last line of the story. This is how the story finished. So we say that line, and then we'll read them both at the same time again. Go for it. And that's how I met your mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, we almost have a story at this point. Um, so how on earth do we get from deploying a new service to uh, meeting someone's <laughs> mother? So let's see how that goes. Does anyone have any ideas for the next point of this story? Go for it. Come straight up. I'm not judging <laughs> That's, there is no judgment here. <laughs> uh, so say your line and we'll read everything again. So say it again. Can I yeah, you say okay. your line, that's fine. But then I decided that Netflix would be a better idea. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to, now we'll read the whole line and see where we're up. This is like a sprint review. <laughs> I was about to deploy a new service to production. But then I decided that watching Netflix was a better idea. And that's how I met your mother. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting quite dark. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll give you that for when they come up. Uh, who wants to continue the story? Uh, oh, here we go. Well, we could put a chair by the side of the stage. Oh, oh, look at that. What a pro. <laughs> However, I was on Flake Hotel Internet. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I was about to deploy our new service to production. And then I decided that watching Netflix was a better idea. However, I was on Flake Hotel Internet. <laughs> and that's how I met your mother. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Um, there you go. Where are we going with this? Flaky hotel internet. Go for it. Oh, you're going to have to say it a lot. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> go for it. So I decided to go down to the bar. Oh. <laughs> so I was about to deploy our new service to production. And then I decided that Netflix was a better idea. But it was on flaky hotel internet. So I decided to go to the bar. And that's how I met your mother. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a story. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, you. There we go. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. So what happened here? Did we tell a good story? Yeah. What do you think? You think it was good? OK. I think that I find that when I do this exercise, the stories, you know, they can range from, like, one part cancelled early Netflix miniseries to epic Hollywood blockbuster. I don't know. We're, we're kind of, I think we've got the basis of a brilliant hacker romance there. <laughs> uh, I, I think it could be, could be rather beautiful. Um, yeah, somewhere like a cross between hackers and Mrs. Robinson or something <laughs> like that. Um, so, was the activity engaging? Did people find it engaging, both as observers and participants? Yeah? So why do you think it was engaging? What made this exercise interesting? Any ideas? Go for it. Just say and I'll repeat the it. Moment the moment of surprise. So not knowing what's happening next, not knowing what the next person is going to say. Go for it. Uh, there was no wrong idea or wrong thing. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, no, there's absolutely no wrong idea. When you're working through these ideas, people say stuff, and everyone just evolves around the story as it comes together. I think there's a, there's a few other things that happen here as well. It's completely safe to contribute ideas, which is what we said. There's no wrong ideas. It was safe for anyone to say anything, and it didn't really matter. We just work with it. We also have autonomy. You know, I'm not there saying, you, you, you. People just can come up, or not, as they choose. It's up to them. And it is safe to fail. An idea might work, it might not. And that goes to both an individual contribution, but also the story itself. What's interesting about the exercise is that while the output is technically a story of some kind, what really happens is you have a group of people learning about listening, about communication, and about acceptance. There's another nice aspect to this, which is the main thing, that this idea you mentioned around surprise is that we really love, or rather hate, an unfinished loop. We, can, we loathe a story that is unfinished. Anyone that's ever browsed around the internet, I'm imagining you've done that once or twice, and you might see a, a headline that reads something like, check out these 10 celebrities from the 90s. You won't believe how ugly they are now. Number eight is horrific. And you will think, I hope, um, I have absolutely no interest in celebrities from the 90s or how ugly they are now, but oh my god, I need to see number eight. <laughs> I have no idea why. I just can't stop myself. And you click through and you click through and you click through. It's generally pretty disappointing. And then you have to go and have a shower and you don't mention it to anyone, definitely not in front of an audience uh, <laughs> being, being, uh, being filmed. Um, so what I find interesting about about this idea of safety. And one thing that I often do is I try to make my own definition of something as a way of taking my ideas or thoughts or research and trying to turn them into something more concise. And this is the definition that I came up with. You're safe when you can speak your truth, raise your concerns, and give and receive constructive feedback without the fear of humiliation, rejection, or punishment. I'm not trying to undermine the, uh, the message that was given by Amy Edmondson or other people that have worked in that field and that research by coming up with my own definition. Um, but what I wanted to do was take out the things that I saw as really critical indicators to whether or not I considered a team to be safe or not. 
So how do we get this safety? There's some interesting problems here. We see, like Google's Project Aristotle, and if you go to rework.google.com, they have these various things like checklists and things you can use to assess your teams uh, on their five indicators. And the problem I have is that it's not that they're not checking in these checklists against things that would genuinely indicate whether or not a team is psychologically safe or not for an individual. My problem is that, and maybe I'm just overly cynical, but I can kind of imagine probably not that long, maybe a year from now, maybe it's already here, a certified organizational safety consultant walking around to an office with a clipboard going, Oh, yeah, great. There's good eye contact in that meeting. Oh, and uh, sorry, in this retrospect, are there any managers in the room? No? Good. Yay. Yeah. And oh, fantastic. A nice big round table. We like round tables. Good. And they get to the end of the day, and they say, fantastic. Your, you know, your score is AA star. Uh, you could really work on doing AAA star next year. Uh, I'll send you my invoice tomorrow and see you for your reevaluation. I don't know, but my gut tells me that that is not going to help us improve organizational safety in organizations. And one of the things I found is that what I found really interesting is that I will see and work with teams that, especially now that I've become more aware of this as a concept, are desperately unsafe, <laughs> that are very obviously failing to communicate effectively with one another, that they cannot express ideas, they cannot um, openly give and receive feedback to one another. But if you were to actually ask them, or if they were to see this talk, for example, and discuss it, they'd say, well, you know, at least we're not unsafe like those other teams. And I found that many teams and organizations are really unaware of both, an, at an individual level and a team level, of just how unsafe they are. So a practice that I try to encourage is a thing I call paying attention. And this breaks down into three levels of awareness. The first level is what I call experiential. Now, this is me or you, there you are, <laughs> being aware of your own level of safety and being a little mindful about that. So when you're sat in a meeting or sat having a conversation with the team, you're thinking, was I able to say all of the things that I wanted to say there? And if not, why not? Why wasn't I able to say the things that I needed to say? What's holding me back? What am I worried about? What am I scared of in that situation? This is not externalized. This is just your own internal awareness of that situation. And then at the next level is what I call extrinsic safety. This is your team. These are the people that you work with every day, not the broader organization. And this is you expanding that level of awareness out to the rest of that team and beginning to become observant and curious about what's going on, saying, oh, wow, isn't it interesting that you know, Jim and James, or whatever, they were chatting, and they seemed to be quite open, and then something changed, and they weren't open anymore. They didn't feel like they can contribute. Or why is it that Jenny, who's normally quite loud in this other meeting setting, isn't? Now, that doesn't mean that you have a conversation with them. It could do. It doesn't mean that. It's just increasing your awareness and your understanding. And if you're speaking to them about the same thing, then everyone is increasing their awareness and their understanding of their situation. One of a, a really nice story, there's an organization um, called Menlo Innovations. They're based in Ann Arbor, which is just outside of Detroit. And their CEO, Rich Sheridan, told me this nice story about a culture that they have and a, a thing and a practice they've done for a long time there which is that if you see someone, and this is anyone in the organization, not just like your subordinates or something else like that, um, who is, let's say, just has unsatisfactory behavior. That could be anything from being a bit unprofessional, being grumpy, whatever it might be. You don't judge them or get irritated with them. <laughs> you take them to the side, and the first three words of that conversation should be, are you OK? Because the assumption is that that person wants to do the best they can do. 
And there must be something holding them back, something that's stopping them from doing that. That might be work, that might be personal, that might be something else. But the assumption is that they want to do the best they can do. And that's a really important idea, that when you're seeing negative behavior, that you address that with curiosity and not judgment. Another colleague of mine called Tim Ottinger says, unless you can replace judgment with curiosity, you really can't love anyone at that until that point. At the next level up, once we get out of there, we look at the whole organization. In fact, not just the organization, but everything outside of your team. And I call this the environmental safety. This breaks down into two areas. You do have the organization. Okay, now this is generally, uh, and this obviously depends. Like, if you're the CEO here <laughs> of an organization, then your position in this is very different. Um, your level of influence is the main differentiator here. If you have a massive influence on the entire organization, then really a lot of these layers are less important, um, or at the very least, you have a greater degree of control over them. As an engineer or a team member, you will often sit in the middle of this space. So what's important here in the organizational level is that you basically have um, very little control over what happens with these. These are things like organizational policies. Who knows, I don't know, do you, I'm guessing you wouldn't have something as barbaric as this, but does any, do we have the show The Apprentice? I'm sure some know about The Apprentice. There's a recent US person that was involved in the US version. Um, that is not a great demonstration of effective leadership and management or team structure. What you have is a bunch of people who are essentially pitched against each other while being encouraged to collaborate. Um, we see this in organizations quite a bit. If you've heard of the term stack ranking, not thankfully, I have seen it. So I have seen it in development organizations and engineering, but generally you see it a lot in sales, where salespeople are pitched against each other and ranked based on their performance. The problem is, is that if my success depends on you failing, <laughs> it's not really a fantastic environment for collaboration. At the next level, we have what I call the person. And this is, well, this is you and your life. This is everything else that you bring. What's important here is that we do this thing in organizations where we say, oh, you know, it's unprofessional to bring your personal life into the office, into work. You leave your personal life at home and you, and I, I don't know about anyone else, but I've not yet found a cloakroom large enough to just hang my personal life on and just go off completely compartmentalized from my life. Um, the reality is, if you're a parent and you have been up all night with a, a child with a fever, for example, you are going to be shitter in the office the next day. That's just fact. You will be. And, and actually, your organization can either ignore that reality and suffer the consequences of the fact that your effectiveness will be affected, or they can support those needs and address those needs. It's up to them. <laughs> the problem I have with this is, is that really, when it comes down to it, your children, your spouse, your parents, your friends are way way more important than anything in this organization, way more. And if your organization isn't supporting that as well, then again, they're not hiring you as a whole human being, which you will always be. So paying attention is about noticing how you feel yourself, noticing how the people around you are feeling, and approaching people and the organization with curiosity and not judgment. So as we come to a bit of a close, why does this stuff really, really matter? There are a whole bunch of benefits here. You can demonstrate, and these days there is more than Google's study, um, but Google's study is pretty influential, that demonstrates that if you can improve safety in your teams and your organizations, your teams will be more effective. At the end of the day, that's going to improve your bottom line. You're going to make more money. You're going to be more effective as, as, as an organization. That's great. But what really got me engaged with this topic is that this has far deeper resonance. So a company called Gallup, produce an annual survey, this is from 2017, 
um, looking at engagement. This is um, specifically, this, this particular research is looking at US stats, um, but basically this, these stats are slightly better in Europe, a couple of percent generally, and slightly worse uh, in Asia, but generally these have been static for almost two decades now. This shows us that, I mean, we're talking about 65% of generally, we can assume the global workforce pretty much, are, in, are actively disengaged or disengaged from their work. This 15%, the actively disengaged, remember the energy black holes from before? They are actively disengaging the 35% that actually love what they do. And I'm pretty certain there's a few people that would say they love what they do here, and you know how it feels to work on teams with people like that. They eat into your engagement, they eat into your enthusiasm for the work. And that's not a judgment on them, I point out, but it is a fact. Interestingly, from 2015, the American Psychological Association uh, did, they do an annual study, and they found out that 66% consider work to be a very or somewhat significant contributor to their, uh, their stress levels, their negative stress levels. And of those, one in two said they lost patience with or shouted at their partner or yelled at their kids while they were stressed. It's kind of a sad judgment. So I was very interested in this relationship between stress and engagement. And there's a whole bunch of studies that show if I go into an organization and I measure the stress levels of the employees uh, using a standard scale, um, and they register as pretty high stress levels, that generally engagement will be low in those organizations. This is not that surprising. Now, there are literally hundreds of studies that demonstrate this exact same finding. What I was stuck on was, to me, I felt like the inverse relationship was more interesting. And what I discovered was this very interesting model called the Job Demands Resources model that was, came out of a lady called Evangelina Demaruti uh, back in 2001. Um, and this has been continued, this model has been developed over the last, you know, seven, eight years that it's been used, or sorry, longer than that, 17 years that it's been used. So I, uh, we're not going to have time to go into it in detail, um, but I want to tell a couple of stories that I think demonstrate this quite well. So imagine you're in the office, it's about 7 p.m., and you're thinking, uh, kind of time to go now, <laughs> and your boss charges in through the door, flings the doors open, and he walks in, and he goes, shit, shit, shit! And you look up from your desk, and you're like, are you all right? And he's like, no, I'm not okay. Oh, for goodness sakes, the CEO's coming tomorrow. And you're like, uh, and that's a bad thing? And he's like, of course it's a bad thing, he wants to see a demo. And you're like, uh, okay, all right, a demo of what? And he goes, the project. Obviously, the project. He said, Sorry, you, you mean the project I just started two hours ago? Je yes, that project. Obviously, that project. Look, I'm stressed. He goes home, I don't know, pours himself a bath with bath salts or something to relax, and you're at the office. And you're trying to get a demo together of this thing you started two hours ago. And now it's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight. You've had like two liters of coffee, so you're like this. 2 a.m., and you just about have something that works. Like, you know the mouse pointer? If it moves two pixels to the left, it's not going to work. But as long as it will just about work. And you go home, and you're pretty stressed. Now it's 7 p.m., and you're in the office, and you have just started the project, you know, the one that you love, that you've just finished the crappy project that you've been, that's been dragging on and on and on and on, and you're on this project and you love this work, and you look up at the clock, and it's 2 a.m., and you're like, oh, 
like, oh, okay, I better get home. The wife's going to be angry with me. So you jump in a taxi, you go home, you climb into bed, the wife rumbles at you appropriately and rolls over. And you're lying in bed, and the ideas are still going round and round and round in your head. And you think, bugger it, okay. And you sit up and pull up your laptop because you can't stop. Wife gets up, tells you to bugger off, goes into the spare room. You don't even notice her because you're so stuck in the work. You keep going until the sun is coming up outside. The birds are tweeting. It's still early. You've barely even had a shower. You slam your laptop closed, run into work, charge in through the door, open the door, and say, I've done it, waving your laptop in the air heroically. And the team sit down with you and say, that's great, let's have a look. And they look at the code and they say, look, this is great, but please don't ever work through the night ever again. Uh, and, and you start the process of refactoring. Um, now, despite maybe the slight disappointment at the end, that second person, that second story, you are loving what you're doing. You're passionate about it. And despite having probably worked for six hours longer than the other person, you're not stressed. What they found out and what they demonstrate with this model is that when we're engaged, it's like a shield to the negative effects of stress. When we love what we're doing, we don't even notice. And that's really, really important. So, to finish. Safety is the number one indicator of effective teams. And without it, you really don't get engagement. <laughs> you can't be engaged in an environment when you can't be you, when you can't say what needs to be done, when you can't ask questions. And without engagement, we have lower resilience to workplace stress. The World Health Organization calls stress the epidemic of the 21st century, and they believe that it costs the US economy $300 billion a year. But it's not about the money. <laughs> this is about your health, but not just your health, your health and your relationships with those that you hold closest to you, your children, your loved ones, your friends. That's what really matters. Safety is a very profound thing, and not being emotionally abusive in the workplace sure would make the world a better place. Thank you very much.